Good morning and uh, welcome everybody uh, to this session on uh, new perspectives on, on citizen engagement for urban resilience. I am Ares Gavas from the Barcelona City Council um, Resilience Office and I will be moderating this session where we will explore the role on, of citizens engagement and the use of citizen generated data as a key uh, instrument to ensure a proper adaptation in cities to climate change. So, uh, and we will have a series of, of six presentations on, uh, on projects. And in the end, we will have some time for Q&A from the audience. So I'm going to, to ask you to, to send your queries to, to the chat so we can use them at the end of the session. And with no further delay, I'm going to introduce the first speaker who is Pamela Duran. She is a PhD uh, architect in urbanism and postdoc in sustainable management of cultural landscape. And she's going to present the REMCA project, which is uh, on resilience beyond emergency, experience, challenges, and actions after the earthquake in uh, Tome Tochimilco in Mexico. So thank you, Pamela, and the floor is yours. You are a mute, sorry, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the kind introduction and for the opportunity to present the, the experiences of, uh, of our RECMA project, Resilience Beyond Emergency at this conference. Uh, the project I want to present consisted on assessing risk management once the emergency situation of an acute shock was already over. Thus, in an attempt to, to help making use of our expertise. The Technical University of Munich tandem with Universidad de las Americas Puebla in Mexico in a collaborative um, project financed by the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research. Through a science lab, we won a grant of 15,000 euros, which although small, allowed us to make miracles by investing in capacity building for community engagement. We had activities such as uh, workshops on on resilience, on RGIS, an open stakeholders forum, and a learning by doing training on vernacular Adobe architecture for the community to learn how to rebuild their houses uh, through the reconstruction of, of the house of an affected family. But please let me start from the beginning. In 2017, three major earthquakes made Mexico shake in horror. Two of them were devastating. The first one, a magnitude 8.1 earthquake happened on the 7th of September with the epicenter near Chiapas here in the Pacific coast. It caused more than 90 deaths and over 200 injured people. The second one, a magnitude 7.1 earthquake hit the center of the, of the country as you can see here in the, in the image um, on the 19th of September. That was on the 32nd anniversary of the 1985 earthquake that buried Mexico City under the rubble. It caused uh, 370 deaths, more than 6,000 injured. Uh, the damages of both, both earthquakes are estimated in uh, around 44,000 buildings, more than one and a half mil, uh, billion euros. What was the response of the official institutions and the civil population? Let's place ourselves in context. The Corruption Perception Index by Transparency International, which ranks how the public sector is perceived in a scale from one to 100, in which 100 is transparent and one is highly corrupt, Mexico scores 29 points. That means that Mexico is among the 50 most corrupted countries in the world. So the response um, ranked from uh, fake heroic operations to international aid that was sent and not received or better said distributed to the thousands of building permits that were issued without complying with the regulations. And thus many buildings could not resist the seismic movements. Concretely, in our case study, Tochimilco, the mayor suddenly disappeared, leaving the population helpless for weeks. And when she finally came back to the workstation, the municipal authorities distributed pre-assembled packages of cement bags, concrete blocks, uh, and steel roads to the affected community, disregarding that the mixture of these construction techniques with the vernacular adobe architecture is not only incompatible, but the perfect formula to make the buildings collapse without the need of an earthquake. So each story had its downside, except for the, the work of the rescue dogs who located more than 70 victims and the multitude of volunteers who mobilized en masse to offer their help. It is evident that despite the lack of trust to the government and the media, Mexico is a country of human quality, solidarity and resources. 
Mexico is resilient because it has the capacity to survive, adapt, and overcome. With this idea in mind, let us see the different pieces of the puzzle. We have areas devastated by the earthquakes, international aid, distrust in the official institutions, civil population volunteering, and one year since the earthquake until the beginning of our project, because the actions, especially in small towns, were already abandoned after the initial collective euphoria for volunteering. What you do with all of these pieces? Well, we built a dream team. Doom, uh, the Technical University of Munich and Universidad de las Américas Puebla, UDLAP, are two renowned academic institutions. From Doom's side, we have the technical knowledge about mapping. We know about GIS, remote sensing, photogrammetry. We know about environmental risk management, including uh, floods, landslides, fires, droughts, earthquakes, climate change. We know about land information infrastructure, civil protection and defense, and so on. From Woodlab side, they know everything about local architecture, built heritage, they have the human resources, the connection with the local partners and stakeholders, and most importantly, they are located near the epicenter of the second earthquake, thus they have the experience. They provided the case study and the communication with the affected community. The picture speaks for, for themselves. This is uh, me with my land management students during a, a lecture about drone flights, and these are Woodlab students, uh, architecture students, students evaluating the structural damages of different buildings immediately after the earthquake. And this takes us to the case study. The epicenter of the second earthquake was not far from Popocatépetl Volcano in a small town called Tochimilco, which is about 50 kilometers from the city of Puebla and about 175 kilometers from Mexico City. So Tochimilco, our selected case study is located in a risk area one because of volcanic hazards, floods, and now earthquakes. It is a small town with less than 20,000 inhabitants with its own identity, heritage sites, colonial architecture built with local materials such as mud and volcanic stone that was severely damaged due to the earthquake. Thus, REGMA project focused on international transdisciplinary collaboration, human capacity building, stakeholders participation, community engagement, and knowledge exchange to strengthen governance and catalyze the, the resilience of Tochimilco. To do so, we design uh, an, an action plan to address strategic planning, risk management, project development, and cartography update. With a UAV expert, we conducted six, um, 16 drone flight missions with a Phantom 4 Pro drone and captured 3,181 images of Tochimilco. The data received from the UAV were processed uh, with the help of the chair of photogrammetry uh, at the Technical University of Munich with a PIX40 software to create a high resolution autophoto which enabled us to draw a highly detailed map of Tochimilco using our GIS software. The autophoto is unfortunately too heavy to put here, so I put this a beautiful aerial picture we took with the, with the drone. Now, with the updated cartography, five experts from, from Germany, Rwanda, and Spain flew to Mexico in order to do field visits and conduct a series of activities. We based on the multidisciplinary framework of the 100 Resilient Cities Program, now um, called the Resilient Cities Network by the Rockefeller Foundation. To design through international workshops with more than 40 students from architecture, land management, civil engineer, and biology, six overlapping resilient strategies for Tochimilco under the topics of emergency response based on the principles of good governance, social and political structures, public space, intangible and built heritage, water management based on the local system of canals and reservoirs, and uh, economic reactivation through agriculture. We also trained Woodlab uh, lecturers in the use of RGIS with a simultaneous workshop because for architects, urban planners, and land managers, cartography and the visual representation of the territory is our common language and our, our working tool. We had an open forum, Stakeholders to Rebuild Mexico, which was the basis to outline the agenda of risk management delivered to the municipal authorities with the participation of different stakeholders, including Amelia, the local You have community. just one minute for yes, to wrap up. thank you. I'm, I'm about to finish. So stakeholders from the local community, NGOs, academics, professionals, and local authorities. We also conducted uh, learning by doing uh, training, construction and Adobe architecture, um, with the aim of rebuilding the house of an affected, uh, of the affected family, uh, with uh, 20 UDLAP students and Tochimilco, um, and all the community. The whole project had an overall of 90 participants, 20 guest experts. So besides of the compilation of the events proceedings, we published one master's thesis and three joint articles, which 
you can read in the following links. As you see, capacity building through RECMA workshops was the kickoff activity of a bigger action plan that led us to trace a strategic plan for sustainable development for touching Milko based on resilience. But the more we can apply this method and tools through this kind of collaboration in many other case studies, especially in the context of climate change, in which emergency response strategies are increasingly urgent and recurrent. This means that regardless of our actions to address the causes of climate change, we should be ready to face its effects. Among them, environmental risks with a higher impact and frequency. To do so, the exchange of scientific knowledge through strategic transdisciplinary collaboration, as in Break My Experience, will enhance capacity building and community engagement for a better future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Pamela. Um, thank you very much, Pamela. Uh, it was a very interesting presentation. I'm sure we will have a lot of uh, questions in the end. And uh, I'm going to introduce the next opponent, which I, I know well. He is uh, Andoni Gonzalez. He works also in the Resilience Office of, of Barcelona, and he's going to talk about, about talk to us about the co-production process of the climate plan here in Barcelona. Thank you, Ares. Um, good morning, all of you. Thank you for attending the, the meeting. Um, I'm going to explain how the city of Barcelona is working out its climate action in collaboration with citizens and civil organizations. As you know, climate change is the great challenge for the human society. Therefore, public administrations play a fundamental role and are forced to lead the climate action. But this is not possible to do it alone. We need the involvement of everybody to overcome this challenge. For that reason, the Barcelona City Council has been fostering the co-production of climate action, engaging on levels of civil society from a long time ago. Um, here, um, you can see the commitment for climate growth of Barcelona for the last 18 years. But it started a long time ago. Maybe you can remember Rio 92 or Albor 95, where uh, human beings realized that uh, something was going wrong. And those events helped to put uh, sustainability in the center of urban policies. <clears throat> um, um, thanks to the Agenda 21, um, was also helped to put the sustainability in the center of our lives. And the Agenda 21 evolved and with it, over the time when climate change became a reality. And in our city, it supposed the commitment for climate 2002. It was the first step in the climate action pathway, and then others came after. This road of commitment has two different spheres. One international, with the signature of the different compacts of mayors, and the agreements of uh, Paris COP21. Uh, and also the participation in campaigns like in making cities resilient. In the other hand, you can see at the local level, the commitment of sustainability 2002 that was renewed in 2012 and led to the commitment for climate in 2015, which was the basis for the launching of the climate plan in 2018 and the last step has been the Climatic Emergency Declaration on the 15th of January of this current 2020. Well, um, once we are all committed to fight against climate change, we need to pass to the action. The renewed citizen commitment for sustainability and the commitment for climate 2015 supposed the creation of the more sustainability, more sustainable Barcelona network formed up to 1,400 signatories, formed by public administrations, schools, co private companies, foundations, universities, uh, research centers. And it was organized into five different areas, uh, schools, uh, commerce, city council, um, companies and entities, and citizenship. <clears throat> the Barcelona Committee for Climate established 10 goals with 100 action lines to tackle climate change, but it also set up the basic lines to enhance the co-production processes. As a result, nine co-producing projects were developed by the more sustainability, sustainable network 
or related to the mitigation and adaptation to climate change and to build up of climate awareness. Those projects go from energy saving to recycling with management, sustainability mobility, green of city rooftops, building reformation, communication and dissemination of climate ethics on the population. And how can we do it? Well, um, setting up the more sustainable network in place a lot of advantages like uh, collaboration with others, sharing experience, gaining knowledge, uh, with relations, and also some added values like uh, attracting investors and financial issues, uh, funding opportunities and business opportunities. Thanks to the technical secretariat of the sustainable network, there are uh, several types of um, contributions that are currently available. <clears throat> this can be individual action plans or double scale action plans made by organizations that develop um, scalable action plans to their members. There are also active networks, or we call it also micro networks, and the higher level are the collaborative projects. Member of several organizations join forces to decide and carry out an initiative. Um, so, real results, uh, as you can see here, we have the Barcelona, the Rosaria Residuo Zero, a campaign to, to, to improve the, um, the waste uh, disposal of the, the neighborhood, the Green Roof Tubes Contest. And that set a uh, grant and subsidies to, to build green group groups of the uh, city. The project Rehabilitam, which is a uh, visit to passive reform and active awareness of the energy poverty, and the awareness campaign united against climate change. Well, um, the good experience of the collaborative projects was fostered within the climate change plan framework with the first call of climate project subsidies in 2018. With the main goals, as you can see here, foster citizen involvement, support collective actions, promote and support innovative initiatives, use of cooperation processes, and contribute to the achievement of the objectives of the Barcelona Commission of Climate. The climate plan sets a budget of uh, 200,000 euros, euros, yes, and um, it has funded 11 projects, which have involved up to 36 different organizations. This project embraced the main aspect of the fight against uh, climate change. Well, um, these were examples about co-production processes for right climate action, but the climate plan itself was also co-produced by citizens in a participatory process. Taking advantage of the decision platform, which is an online platform designed to address participatory processes in the city, the climate plan was open to the contribution of all citizens interested. It was, um, it was, uh, it took uh, four different phases the first uh, presentation, the physical process, a debate, and then a feedback to the participants. And from this external process, more than 100 proposals were received and integrated into the climate plan. Then the climate plan moves into participatory processes that was um, divided into three groups climate and resilience, energy efficiency, and energy culture and climate change awareness. And then be careful with the mic because at some point we cannot hear you very well. Oh, sorry. Should they repeat Better something? No. Should they repeat something? It's uh, something. No, it, it's okay. But just keep in mind that. You... Okay. Okay. Sorry. Sorry for that. Well, so this internal participatory process uh, hold uh, some internal sessions with the municipal areas involved and set up the thematics board. And it was the, um, the work, it has also some divulgative sessions to in the urban ecology agora and the urban districts of, of the city. <clears throat> so this co-production process and 
of production and design process resulted into the climate plan publication in 2018 with four strategic goals that you can see here mitigation adaptation and resilience climate justice and promoting citizen actions the plan is also divided in five areas of activity the people's first starting at home transforming communal spaces climate economy and building together these five areas of activity are divided into 18 action lines, which result in 242 measures to tackle climate change effects in the city of Barcelona. Well, but um, climate plan was not enough to fight climate change, and Barcelona City Council, empowered by a citizen demand, published the Climatic Emergency Declaration this January 2020. The uh, climatic emergency declaration is a step forward in the climate action of the city and sets more ambitious targets like reducing 50% emissions compared to 1992 uh, and sets also 1 million euros per year in subsidies for citizen projects. The emergency climatic declarations uh, means a change of model of the, of the, of the city of our society. Sorry, yeah. You, you need to wrap up in one minute. Okay, I, I'm finishing the last one. Okay. Yeah. So um, the emergency, uh, climatic emergency declaration uh, supposes a change of model of our way of living, of our society. Uh, it's a change of the urban model, uh, a change of mobility, uh, a change in the use of energy, uh, the economic model, the change of consumption and waste model. Uh, also the food and the change of cultural and educational model. The declaration also considers two adaptations, is the look after the health and uh, take care of the water. Um, well, that's all from, from my side. I hope you have enjoyed. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Andoni, for this excellent overview on the climate action co-production process here in, in Barcelona. And we're going to jump to the next uh, presentation, which is by Els Likens. She's a strategic consultant in uh, water management at Aquafin. And uh, the title of her presentation is from a holistic urban resilience methodology to implementation on the field by the use of innovative tools. So thank you very much Els and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, I cannot put my video on, apparently. Okay, I will uh, start sharing. Um, so I'm Els Likens from Aquafin, and we are the water treatments company in Flanders, but we also do a lot of um, consultancy and project management for municipalities for um, all kinds of water, rainwater, and um, Yes, thank you. Um, groundwater even. And uh, we also do a lot of research and innovations on the water management uh, nowadays. So as we all know, um, climate change has a great effect on the uh, water cycle and we should have a different view, a different ap approach to look at this system. And therefore, uh, we, we say it's a holistic approach where we take all the water uh, sources and water demands and then we start to see how can we relate to each other and which is the best destination for each drop of water, which is very valuable. Um, the climate change is um, nowadays um, not so much in the attention anymore with the pandemic, but um, of course these strikes were kind of a, um, awareness rising um, for all people to say, um, yeah, the heat stress and the water uh, stress is really important to look at on a global scale. Um, and we tried to do this on a city scale in Antwerp. Uh, the Urbanisten made the water plan and we did the stormwater plan for Antwerp where we started from a, a citywide view. And from there we arranged how can we uh, manage the water at its best for this city scale wide vision. Therefore, we needed to create a context where also the urban um, 
context and spatial uh, parameters were uh, involved in the water modeling system. So we don't look at it as separate systems where we take the water underground, but we try to find ways for water to uh, be above ground and to get the best um, destination also for reuse and sort of uh, things. So there are three main uh, characteristics in the water plan. That is the quality of the urban space, also water in climate change context and the consciousness of water, which is the importance for all uh, people, of course. In a city context, we have different, um, oh, different landscapes. We have natural areas where we have a lot of space and a lot of possibilities. We also have like the big lanes with a lot of green area where we can have find opportunities for infiltration or reuse. But we also have the very city center where the streets are small and as well under and above above ground, there is no space left for uh, water solutions and measures. And in these areas, we really need the citizen engagement to uh, take measures on their own uh, private space for um, the challenges of floods and droughts. So the city was divided into 11 typologies of this type uh, with different uh, kinds of areas. And for each typology, there was also seen which kind of solutions or measures um, were possible for these regions. So these are some solutions um, and there's like a, a wide range of about 60 of these different uh, cards where you can see what is the impact on floods, on droughts, on heat stress for each solution? Is it a big scale solution or a small scale solution? What is the cost of it? And it's also divided into private space area or public domain um, areas. So these are fit together so we can really go into the best possible um, solutions for each terrain. Now, um, then we have this vision of the city scale, but we need to find ways to implement it on the field. So therefore we need a whole new uh, perspective as well on the project planning. And this is just a chart of what is all needed uh, to uh, be looked at from a different perspective now. So from the project proposal, we look at the urban planning as well, and we see different perspective and all stakeholders into account. And that the context creation, water should be taken into account from the very start of a project um, where next to mobility, it's really an important parameter to the uh, context for this project. In project design, we need different innovative uh, engineering tools and software to calculate and dimension these different solutions that we are taking for water management. And uh, we need also new guidelines for contractors and uh, work on the field, uh, new material indexes. And this needs, of course, also the new skills for how are we gonna implement it? How are we gonna put it on the field? What is the, um, how, how will we control if it's working? What is the efficiency rate and stuff? This means different um, responsibilities, different financial streams. So all this system is looked at from a different view and we're doing all these uh, things to make sure that this holistic vision uh, wide on a city scale can be put into projects on the field on a smaller uh, dimension and scale. So what is possible? This is uh, an example of a street which could be um, implemented uh, where the water solution is at the same uh, quality and quantity. We can buffer the same amount of water, but citizens can get engaged to choose which kind of solution they want in their street. You can have a sport field or recreation area, or you can have a more natural area. Um, and so we have different um, concepts that we can uh, put together and then the citizens can also give their uh, meaning and say what they want in their street and in their neighborhood. And then they also get a, uh, awareness creation of why this is needed, why the water should be um, infiltrated in the soil and what this will have as an impact on their uh, own territory. Um, these solutions can be uh, multi-scale, so big scale solutions, small scales, uh, multi-level also. We look from the roof of the, of the buildings until the uh, underground and also multiple. So here you see a playground, it has multiple uses. Um, 
but the soup bowl you see can be filled with water when there's a storm and then it's like a real soup bowl that's filled and in this time no children will be playing in this uh, playing ground so it's um, a combination of different uh, uses that also can be uh, uh, projected to the citizens what how they want to to see their uh, area this is another um, uh, example so this is more an urban example which this can also be filled with water and then there's possibility for the reuse of this rainwater that comes from the neighborhood's pavements and here's another example um, but also just a normal street we are really trying to uh, get for this climate change, uh, enhance the bi biodiversity, heat stress, and so we can together with uh, all participants, all citizens and politicians, see what is the best way to, um, to make the streets um, climate adapted. To do this, we also need technology and innovation systems. Um, so therefore we needed different software, different smart systems to be sure that this also fits into the wider water management. And one is AquaSense, where we really calculate the impact of all these different uh, measures and solutions like a tree. What is the impact on the water management, a green roof? How much impact does it have on the bigger uh, scale of this uh, area? And so we can have different scenarios for us for the same project inf infrastructure project and see what is now the best uh, possible solution. One um, measure is like a building block, like a green roof is a building block. And then we can see how much water flows into there, how much water will be infiltrated, will be reused, will be evapotranspirated. And what is then the overflow, what kinds of water will uh, flow out. Um, in this manner, we can make different scenarios and we can combine them and evaluate which scenario will actually uh, score best on volume percentage, um, overflow reduction of the peak uh, from the storm and even particle removal. So also the water quality is take, taken into account. If you have and one then, minute left, okay, thank you. Good. Thank you. So this is a good tool for decision making for different kinds of uh, scenarios where you combine different solutions and so we can say decision making on the quantity and decision making on the quality and even on the um, space for the neighborhood. This is how a tree can be uh, calculated. So from the growth rate, we can calculate how much water it needs. Also, the water expert is a consultant that will go on the private areas uh, for citizens and that can deliver um, consultancy about what can you do in your backyard, uh, what's possible for you and how can you profit from it also for floods and droughts, but even insulation on your roof, even the water bill can be uh, lowered by reusing all your rainwater and so on. So we all have these different measures for the private areas and the water expert can uh, give advice to the citizens. Actiput is a, a, a smart system for rainwater uh, wells where we can combine the rainwater uh, wells with a sewage system in the street and so we can lower the um, water level in the in the wells when there's a storm coming and the buffer uh, is created to uh, if, uh, avoid floods and in dry season the water can be hired so the people have access to their rainwater as well. So this is a smart system with sensors on rainwater wells and another one is the grey water reuse we are also providing where uh, water from showers and sinks can be uh, even naturally or technology treated to re reuse again in the buildings or in industry or so ever. So we are seizing opportunities in a changing world for climate adaptation and we uh, try to find all best solutions and optimize in this manner the water cycle to its best. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much Els for this very inspiring presentation. You really explored all the possibilities of water management. We always have a lot to learn from the Netherlands on this topic. So we're going to jump to the next presentation, which is by Valentino Santucci. He's uh, from the University of Foreigners of Perugia, and he's going to talk about geolocalized citizen generated data for urban resilience. And Valentino, the floor is yours. Yes. Sorry. 
can you see my screen? I think. Yes. Okay. So uh, I am Valentino Santucci. I'm a computer scientist, and in this talk, uh, I want to describe you a project. More than a project, it is an idea of a project because it is not yet realized. And uh, the project is about uh, geolocalized uh, citizen-generated data for urban resilience, a dynamic data stream clustering approach using natural language processing tools. So, so it's about using AI uh, to help urban resilience. Uh, let's start with the first observation that uh, during the last uh, centuries, uh, the world population uh, is continuously moving uh, to cities. And uh, this, uh, this uh, increase of the population uh, living in the cities is, is expected to increase again in the coming decades. Clearly, sorry, clearly, uh, this impact on the, this has a huge impact on the city's infrastructures. Let's think, let's think for example, to roads, power grids, uh, water grids, uh, public transportation. Uh, in many cities, uh, this infrastructure has been built uh, many years ago. Uh, for instance, in uh, European cities, uh, sometime also decades or centuries ago. Let's think to Rome, for instance. Uh, clearly, uh, for cities management, it is difficult to handle this uh, population growth. At the end, we can say that the population growth is an issue for cities management. But maybe it is also an opportunity because uh, in the very recent years, uh, there is an ubiquitous diffusion of uh, technologies like uh, smartphones, for instance. And a citizen can uh, potentially produce a huge amount of useful data with their uh, smart devices. So the, the main ideas are, why not using this data in order to improve the management of the cities? And why not using these technologies in order to engage the, citizen, the citizens in the management of the cities? This is the two main question. And uh, at the end, we can say that the population growth uh, <clears throat> is an opportunity in this sense. Okay. So uh, the main idea of this project is uh, to have uh, to to have a smart crowdsourcing system. Uh, we can see the citizen as human sensors that are spread and moves in the city, and they can continuously check for events such as uh, falls in water or power grids, floodings, uh, fires, and so on. Uh, Citizens can send uh, with their smartphone, can send uh, geolocalized text or voice message, for instance, to a chatbot uh, by using a WhatsApp or Telegram or any messaging application on the smartphone. And uh, we, it is possible to develop a system behind the chatbot that collects these messages and organizes them uh, by automatically grouping the related messages together, automatically assign priorities to, to any message group, to any message cluster, and automatically sends uh, alerts or, recommend, or recommendation to the decision makers. Okay, all the process can do can be done automatically. And uh, this is an illustration of the idea. Here we have the citizen with their smartphone that can send the messages, text or voice messages to the chatbot. And the chatbot can build automatically an events board where uh, we can uh, put the, the different events in order of priority. Uh, for instance, here we have uh, in red the highest priority event that was uh, uh, reported by around 10,000 citizens, a medium level uh, event reported by around 2,000 citizens and so on. Then the system can, uh, can uh, generate automatically alerts or recommendation and send these alerts to the decision makers like the city's major, uh, like the uh, policeman station, the fireman station, or, or also automatically to the citizen. 
all these things uh, are possible with the with the nowadays technology and the artificial intelligence technology. For instance, uh, everybody know that uh, we can use, uh, we can send the geolocalized messages using the GPS in our smartphone. Uh, maybe something that is not known to the audience is that uh, in artificial, in the artificial intelligence field, uh, there, there are a lot of natural language processing tools that uh, that can mine concept from uh, from a natural language text and also summarize this con concept and elaborate them and uh, put all of them together and cluster them using a data stream clustering algorithms. All these technology are nowadays uh, real. They are, it is possible to apply them and uh, they make it possible to implement the, the system that I depict to you before. Uh, some other points is, uh, are who run the system? Uh, clearly, if it is a system for, uh, for the city management, maybe a city institu institution can run this system. So uh, an entity that has trust from the user, another from the citizens, sorry. Uh, another possibility is uh, to not assign the trust to only one entity, but distribute the trust on all the citizens and elaborate and use a distributed blockchain-based system to realize what we seen before. Uh, the, the talk is finished. It was a very short talk because this is a, a, an idea for a project that we had planned to implement, but due also to the uh, pandemic emergencies, we have to move to other, uh, to other activities, unfortunately. But uh, uh, the final message is that uh, all of this, uh, this system can be realized with the nowadays technologies. And uh, I think it can be useful for the management of cities. This is my... And I finished. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valentino. Sure, technologies and, and citizens have a huge potential in, in risk management that we still need to, to explore. Uh, so we're going to go through the next presentation, which is by Felicismo Tejuco and Henry Felix from the University of Santo Tomas College of Architecture who are going to talk about the experience in the España Boulevard in, uh, that connects Manila and Quezon uh, City. So the floor is yours. Buenos dias. Uh, mi nombre felicísimo L. S. Henry. It is our honor to present the proposed uh, the paper enhancing the pedestrian's experience in España Boulevard through an adaptive climate strategy, a socioeconomic study of the Sampaloc Skywalk. As a backgrounder, our proposed study started as early as 2016, and it has been a two-year ongoing study aimed to introduce an innovation, an elevated skywalk, uh, having been presented to stakeholders, community, uh, academicians, and fellow architects and planners. It aims to blend the city's urban landscape and also a response to adaptive climate strategy. This afternoon, we would want to share with you our proposed solution to society and how it can help the economics of the city of Manila. One of the factors that led us to this study is the uh, usual problem of traffic combined with flooding in our city. And like the, the pandemic that we are experiencing right now, the limitation of movement is similar when we have flash floods in the city of Manila. Another uh, concern sometime in the 2014, aside from a government employee being electrocuted because of wires caught in the flood water, we are saddened by the news that one of our medical students in the University of Santo Tomas died from electrocution during that onslaught of Tropical Storm Mario in September 2014. For this study, we combined the methodologies of archival online research survey, focus group discussions, public consultation, and presentations to stakeholders and our fellow academicians. This is complemented by a cyclic theoretical framework, which we have been doing as an ongoing research. 
It is uh, combining the sectors of economics, social, historical, and environmental. As an ongoing study, this evaluation feasibility study has been presented to society, continuously revised, and presented also to our city government. And in the future, we do hope that this will be implemented soon. As output of this uh, consultative uh, research work, we have conducted public consultations, focus group discussion, and one of the major output during the workshop is the collective vision of the stakeholders. They envision an Espana Boulevard to be safe, flood-free, and well-maintained, a major road with disciplined uh, pedestrians, drivers, unobstructed sidewalks, green landscaping, efficient utilities, and police visibility. Together with the consultation outputs, the survey covered more than or almost 1,300 respondents, and according to their perception, they view our stretch of Espana Boulevard, majority 75%, as a very good means of access to basic services and also public transportation. On the public perception, on the negative side, they view this side, uh, this street and sidewalk as not pedestrian friendly, and during typhoons and flash floods, water does not easily subside. To continue the discussion, I will move. Uh, I will have Architect Herrera present the recommendations and findings. We have uh, going. We are going to present to you to, to continue. We are going to present to you the pedestrianization strategy that we have provided. This is referred to, or we call it, as Ampalok Skywalk. It approximately spans two kilometers from the Welcome Rotonda area, which is here, the circle or uh, oblong area up to this Lerma uh, provided pedestrian overpass. It spans two kilometers. And as you can see, the link that we have provided here, they are all connected to existing pedestrian overpasses. This is a composite structure made of metal, concrete, and glass, which is designed to ease the burden of enduring heavy traffic in the area, especially during uh, rush hours in the morning and in the evening. Now, this particular uh, movement strategy of people, not necessarily going using the public transport, they can also use their, their uh, bikes or maybe foldable bikes. And this seamless access for different destinations is also uh, considered for our PWD or we refer to them as physically challenged individuals and also the elderly. We have provided here a ramp, a one meter uh, of a ramp going to the elevators so that the elevator would not soak in flood water when it's flooded. And also, you can travel by foot coming from the Quezon City area on top and from the south area there. Uh, you can travel by foot going to the station of the Philippine National Railways. The Philippine National Railways is one of the major routes of transportation that we have in our country and it's being augmented right now from this two-lane uh, train station to a four-lane with an overpass for uh, trucks for deliveries. And it would span from the Bicol region down south and up to the north area for the new Clark Green City wherein it's proposed to uh, prepare and uh, place our seat of government, which is Malacanang, to be placed there soon. And this elevated walkway was provided as a covered and uh, uh, alternating covered and open pathway to deter vagrants and criminal elements. This elevated walkway also would be the uh, platform or the station of students who are going to and from their school because this elevated walkway is within the University Belt area, which has Espana Boulevard as one of the major routes. And it can also have a link. We are proposing now the economic means from the social to the economic means. We are proposing linking all the buildings or some of the buildings that are, uh, it is really not being used in along the Espana Boulevard. They are not uh, uh, rented. So we want and propose to the city mayor just a few, I think it was last year, we proposed it to the city mayor of Manila 
that we link and connect these buildings so that econ economy in the vicinity will be more lively. And it is now a new linear, linear park that we can have in this particular vicinity. Now I would like to present you a one minute, one minute video that I'm going to show you that uh, this particular presentation is highlighted with a safe and secured uh, platform for pedestrians, as well as it would be lessening the use of fuel, thus making it uh, less pollution. And we can also mitigate also flood as much as possible. It can also be a good source for the healthy citizenry. That's why we are here. We are proposing this adaptive reuse or adaptive, sorry, adaptive climate uh, strategy for this pedestrian walkway. And in another part of our conclusion, we present a sustainable and resilient response to climate change and also augmenting the socioeconomic development. That's why Felicissimo here and myself, we are proposing this also to the city and showing to the world what we have done so far for the last few years that we have researched and continuing researching of this project. We present you the Sampaloc Skywalk. Thank you very much. Mabuhay. Mabuhay. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. This was a good example on how a, a risk reduction motivated project could end up by being also an opportunity for a more structural transformation and to include uh, environmental criteria. And we're going to our last presentation now, which is by Katerina Witt. She's sorry, <laughs> I'm going to pronounce her surname wrong. Witzinska. And she's going to talk us about a, a game um, on, a, on, well, on a multi benefit coastal protection in, in Denmark. So the floor is yours, Katerina. Thank you very much. Um, so thank you for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, so I'd like to present um, the process of designing a board game, Die or Die uh, Prevail. And this is an um, output of a research project about planning for multi-benefits and coastal protection uh, in Danish context, a collaboration between the University of Southern Denmark, Technical University of Denmark, and a private company, Smith uh, Innovation. And the research um, project started with the concern of the rising uh, sea level and storm surge in Denmark and threatening the economic development of cities. With this, we need to use, uh, uh, let's say, make a smart use of investments, um, but that will produce, uh, we'll say, more uh, to produce more fun multifunctional, multi use of, um, uh, of solutions and the but the complexity of the decisions also grows. Uh, so the aim was to develop the innovative tool that will uh, support municipalities in planning for uh, coastal uh, protection. And um, so in a game, um, you or anyone that decides to play is a, is a mayor, take the role. So the mayor or high exec has a high executive role that face various challenges and opportunities when acting on the coastal protection. Um, mayor invests in a different uh, protection measures such as dike, beach park, waterfront park uh, that protects the city asset, but it will also provide this additional social and environmental benefits. And depending on how adverse the climate event was, uh, whether the city assets were protected and uh, the city maintain its faction and revenue generation or not in this case that would result in damages of the cost and then we have some consideration in the game so do you go for long-term investment short-term multifunctional multi-benefits nature-based solution hard infrastructure or are you taking a risk or uh, or not so to present the elements of the games uh, first we have um, a map of denmark that includes different uh, cities um, that are located either on western, eastern, or 
African southern coast. Um, and the, the coast is um, affected in a different way when it comes to search and sea level rise, which I will explain later, but that's why uh, the initial protection level uh, varies on where the city is located. And the uh, cities has different assets, uh, which could be uh, residential areas, historical city assets, um, um, harbor uh, industry, and the number uh, next to indicate how many units uh, these assets are composed of. So to protect it, um, a mayor needs to buy as many typologies um, as number of units um, in the assets. And the selection of the cities was, and the char characteristic of these initial coastal protection level was that remind by existing assessments and data. So as mentioned, uh, Western, Southern, Eastern coast in Denmark are um, affected in a different terms. Uh, so in the Western coast, the storm surge are more violent than on the other coast. Also there, um, the, the Danish uh, coastal authority designated uh, cities as with the higher risk of flooding. And in 2018, there were new areas added, I mean, new cities and new, um, and new regions. And as well, we have um, an assessments made on the natural areas and areas um, high in property to be also uh, protected. And uh, when it comes to coastal uh, typologies that could be bought, uh, we have a different types. So this could be waterfront park or a beach park. So those are nature-based solutions or hybrids. Uh, we will have a dike, so representing hardiest solution, uh, but there is also um, a dry flood proofing that is targeting the exposure and temporary mobile solutions. So some of them, uh, they could provide additional values as environmental, social, maybe identity, recreation, um, and some could provide uh, opportunities for infrastructure or dike. Each of them provide either 20 or uh, 40 centimeters protection. So as a mayor, you invest um, in some of them uh, before the climate event strike uh, in the game. And just to mention, we put a focus in, um, in these multifunctional, uh, let's say solution multiple post solution that have the integrated design. So they take into account different values as recreational environmental one. Uh, these projects also often are integrated within wider urban development goals, for example, when it comes to uh, recreation regeneration of a whole harbor front area in some cities. Um, also, these solutions can acknowledge the power of nature, dynamic of coastal, dynamic of coast, and goes away from this approach of regime and control and stability and, main, and men over nature. And as well, they present the innovation potential when it comes to uh, partnership, uh, but as well uh, 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 innovation and physical innovation because of the combination of hard and landscape based uh, solution. In the game, we as well have um, challenges and opportunities cards. So those relates to various circumstances and uh, condition that might increase um, hinder, incentivize the, the planning process. And as you see listed, they, they relate to different issues as maybe political agenda, maybe changing of a municipal uh, vision uh, relating to maybe climate projection failure or lack of uh, technical capacities in the, in the municipality or some innovative uh, funding models. Um, in the game, we have a climate event that is composed of storm surge and sea level rise, and it is as a one-time event. Uh, so this graph helps you to, to, to determine if you uh, protected your city uh, or not. So a player throws two dice, and the sum of it will correspond to um, a number, um, and you choose one of the five climate scenarios. But as well, you have to take into account on which um, coast the city is uh, located. And this, oh, 
this climate projection card was developed on the basis of the estimates of Danish storm surge uh, from 2019. We took into account five 20, 100, 1000 year event. There, that's why there are five uh, scenarios. Um, and this one, when it comes to climate event in 2030, uh, it's calculated by adding uh, 10 centimeters more, and that uh, goes for uh, every next uh, year. And in the game, we have as well a board game, so where you keep a track of uh, the most important uh, things. Uh, so uh, you uh, write uh, what kind of assets a city has and with the number of units, what kind of a typologies have you bought. And then in this case, you can um, move these um, typologies to the next um, level of protection. And you calculate um, your budget. Uh, if you took a loan, how much um, units have you spent and the climate event strike. So depending on if there is any shortage um, or not, uh, your budget will be positive or negative. Um, uh, also, the next round you um, take, um, you accumulate the revenue from the multi-benefits and CT assessment if the CT was uh, protected. Um, and at the beginning of September this year, we made a testing with uh, the capital region of Denmark and Svens municipality, both of them deals with coastal uh, protection. Uh, just to mention that that wasn't the only uh, testing made. The, the game uh, development was iterative process. So there was about six testing uh, done with uh, master's PhD students, professors from uh, the Technical University of Denmark and the uh, University of Southern Denmark, but as well with the private company. Um, so this game revealed, um, uh, meaning it, it portrays well the coastal climate adaptation as a complex issue, and it helps to start the discussion of what are the possible path to take. It can also give a good impression about the uh, challenges and opportunities that the municipality face. Um, however, um, there were concerns about that it doesn't portray um, uh, the full spectrum of, of uh, different decisions um, uh, in the municip municipality. That is why it was proposed to add extension uh, when it comes to investment. So how to prioritize between different sectors as the coastal protection is across uh, sectoral uh, involving different stakeholders issue. Um, but as well, the, the game um, um, is, um, it was recommended to use as a tool for citizen engagement, uh, to get their feedback, to provide the learning, um, um, and to, to, to be able to portray in a simple manner, what are the um, complexities, uh, compromises and considerations the municipalities have to take into account. And in Denmark as well, there is a role that who benefits and has to pay. So it's not only the mayor that, um, or the municipality that takes uh, the decisions, uh, but also uh, those who benefits, meaning the citizens. So that is why it would be a vital um, tool to, to engage the citizens. Um, and we also got some feedback about maybe um, developing a shorter or a simple versions um, of the game. Um, so that was the first uh, phase and the, the game will be developed uh, further and uh, maybe in some time, a year or two, hopefully sooner, um, will be available in the market. Thank you very much for, the pres for listening. Thank you, Katarina, and thank you all of the opponents for your interesting presentations and also for speaking to, to the time you, you had to, to present. Uh, now we have some time for questions uh, from the audience. We already have uh, received uh, a couple of them. So I'm going to, to pose them to you. And uh, in the meantime, I also I'm going to ask the audience for, for more questions, any other pressing issue they would like to know um, more about. So the first question we have is, um, is for Els. Uh, I don't know the name of uh, 
who wrote this question, but he or she says uh, very interesting techniques and technologies for urban resilience. And he or she asked uh, how to involve the community and whether there are lessons to share in terms of community engagement to less developed cities and less developed countries. Okay, thank you for uh, this question. Um, as we are the water treatment company and we give uh, consultancy to municipalities, we always start from there for the municipalities to take uh, the, the actions for the citizen engagement, but actually on um, workshops and brainstorms where we uh, try to create the context or concepts for infrastructure planning, we invite uh, all stakeholders from other water companies, but also some uh, people of the neighborhood. We just, um, yeah, we, we, we invite them by, by, uh, by email or by letters uh, that on that um, timing, there will be a workshop for the project in their street. And there they can also give their, um, give their meanings or what they want in the street. And then we try to, to fit together all this, uh, these solutions. And, that's like a transition in phases. Uh, first, it's very wide context creation, and then we start for designing process. And so we have at some points uh, meetings with all these citizens. The water expert is really for um, infrastructure projects where we normally uh, just separate the rainwater and the sewage water in different sewers in the street and where these people went to from house to house to say the water from the roof has has to go in a different pipe than the sewage water. Now, this is a consultancy that also delivers all these other uh, solutions like green roofs, and they try to really um, involve the people in this manner because they have to go there anyway for this project um, to say, uh, let's see what we can do more and what's, what's also a win for you in this case. Um, and other contexts are we have a new website um, for people uh, also with tips and tricks for what they can do in the garden. So we have different strategies to involve the people and uh, we have like a network of all the water companies and the, the, the authorities, but also the, the citizens itself we, we reach by the local governments. And uh, we see that there is a really... Um, this co-creation is really good in uh, finding even more um, um, ambition uh, in these projects than would have done without the, uh, the citizens' engagement. So it's a really good tool to get even more out of the projects um, than without them. But you need the time to do it. Mm -hmm. sure. Thank you. And, and yeah, we have another question for you actually, Else, maybe you... I think you, you probably have already answered it uh, partly. And it's about, sorry, I missed it now. It's on uh, whether private houses, solutions for private houses are already included in, and to some extent also funded by the Antwerp plan. Yes, we have with Antwerp, we have also created like a funding um, like with solar panels, but now for uh, water solutions and even climate adaptation solutions where, where the biodiversity is also taken into account. So people who will renovate or build new houses, they can uh, get fundings uh, depending on how uh, climate adapted their uh, renovation or new house will be. And for um, the, the infrastructure projects on public domain, we are now looking to see, can we divide the financial costs that will be uh, taken by the government itself? And can we maybe find uh, opportunities to give this financial incentive to people uh, to do things on their private ground? So we don't have to take this budget into the public domain and the water can just stay at the source. So these are things we're all looking at right now, and we're. Um, but it takes time to for all this. Um, it's always um, difficult for financial uh, differentiation and uh, for for the law to see how this can be how this can be fit in. You're muted. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, 
Sorry. Um, thank you for your for your answers. We have another question from Gabriela Monteiro. Uh, I understand it's for Katerina. She says, great presentation and thank you. And whether the board game will be available for the general public in other, in other countries, because she thinks it's a very exciting idea. Uh, thank you. Um, so as we, as I said, that the game is still in the um, in the making. Uh, so we need to consider those uh, extensions, simple versions, uh, and it is intended to be an open source. But I think that uh, what we also spoke about is that uh, the how the game was designed maybe um, um, could uh, it could be replicated, meaning that uh, you could use, uh, let's say, the same type of uh, a lot, uh, logic uh, to um, think of what are the challenges and opportunities, the cities, the, the assets, um, and then develop it um, in your own country. Um, uh, but generally speaking, hopefully in some time, the game will be available. There is more parties that uh, will make a decision about that. So that can be my answer for now on. Thank you. Thank you, Katerina. And while we wait for more questions for, from the audience, I have a question from Pam for Pamela. And also if you, between yourself, I mean, <laughs> have questions on, on the other opponents, we can also use this time for, for this. And, and my question for Pamela was uh, whether, I mean, I understand this was a collaboration between the university and, and, the, and the community and uh, whether how to ensure the, the continuity, I mean, because it, it has started a process and it has been a, a good practice and, and how, or if you envision on how to expand this for a, for a longer term for, uh, I mean, to, 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 so that it's not just like some punctual um, experience, but also it becomes something with a, with a, with a continuity between, beyond. Uh, beyond this experience. Well, thank you very much for the interesting question. Um, yes, I think it all depends on the grants as well. So if, uh, if we have the collaboration with the local community and the local stakeholders, such as the NGOs and, and the academics, we can ensure that the case study is not being abandoned. But if we don't have the grants, other than academic projects, we cannot do much. So what we are uh, doing is, um, looking for grants in order to continue with this collaboration in order to reveal Tochimilco, not only uh, one, one house as we did, uh, but uh, to continue rebuilding it and to implement the strategies. Um, we are also expanding this collaboration beyond Tochimilco. We have gone to Quetzalan where there is um, uh, uh, some touristic, cultural touristic infrastructure that is managed by, by women. So we are trying to, to close the gender gap there and involve them also in, in the agricultural process for, um, yes, for boosting the, the economy of, uh, of the town. Uh, there have been also uh, some uh, other capacity building uh, workshops that was, um, that was uh, not an initiative from the Technical University of Munich, but from um, Universidad Iberoamericana Puebla, who contacted us to, to do so. Uh, and that was uh, in order to involve certain stakeholders that were succumbing to the, to the urban growth pressure in, in, in very urban areas. So the collaboration is ongoing. We, we do our best, uh, but it's um, normally, um, an economic matter for, for the project to be implemented. Sorry, you're muted again. I think the host is muting me. <laughs> uh, okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, okay. So thank you very much for your answer, Pamela. I don't know if you have questions for yourself have a question for the other opponents. We don't have no more questions from the audience. If not, I'm going to post maybe some more. No? Okay, 
So, uh, Katarina, I was I was wondering. I think that the game, for what I understand, is in uh, still not um, accessible to the to the public. Uh, but I was wondering whether you had uh, evidence or, or um, any input on the positive impacts on citizenship, may, on in awareness or an, an engagement. I mean, in the beta versions, maybe if you have tried with a community of users or so what is the benefit of this game uh, playful uh, approach to uh, well, so far it's only with the municipality that we uh, tested the game and they actually gave us a feedback that rather than for municipality officials, it, uh, uh, it could be more beneficial to use it uh, for the citizens. Uh, and we did uh, the testing just a month ago uh, uh, at the beginning of September, so we're at the very uh, start. Uh, of the testing. So unfortunately, uh, we have no feedback um, on that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Katarina. Uh, so is there anything left you would like to say? We have still some more, more minutes. If not, we, we can close the session. But if, if you, there's something that maybe you wanted to say in your presentation, you didn't have the time and you would like to take the opportunity to say now, if we can use this, this few minutes we have. No? Okay. So yeah, I think we're going to wrap this up and I will thank you again. With, for, your, for your excellent presentation. I think it's been a very interesting uh, panel. And uh, well, thank you all very much for, for taking part in it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Very much. Thank you very much to all the panelists and the moderator. Thank you very much. Thank you.